Who killed Hawks Lieutenant in France, Matipa? If we ask Henny from Sweden of Open Secret. Welcome, Henny. Good afternoon, Chris. Thank you. Please tell us about the lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel Franz Matipa, from what we know, was a, a dedicated cop. He was somebody who was committed to doing good police work, had spent many years within the South African police um, services, was born in uh, in a small vill- village of uh, Lebotuane in, in uh, the northwest province. Um, and it's only about 70 kilometers away from where he was ultimately assassinated, uh, close to the Hamanskral um, off ramp on the N1. Um, the words used to describe him by people who knew him professionally, who worked with him, uh, was is, is that he's a dedicated, uh, uh, disciplined, hardworking individual. Um, and certainly, you know, I think um, uh, only, you know, the only responses we heard were, were extremely positive. We weren't able to speak to his family despite numerous attempts to do so. But uh, I think, you know, they would have their own story to tell. But I think certainly our, our sense is that professionally, yeah, was somebody committed to holding the powerful to account and obviously worked in the crimes against the state unit within the Hawks. So it's really it's really a top tier unit uh, within the Hawks, which is in- intended to defend um, South Africans against uh, serious crimes involving uh, international, for example, international organized crime or terror groups, etc. Um, and, and it's that type of investigation he was busy with at the time of his uh, his assassination. How exactly did he die? So, so what we do know is that um, on the night of the sixth of August this year, Franz Matipa had indicated to his colleagues that he would be out to investigate a matter he'd been working on for uh, a number of months. It involved the abduction of two individuals, allegedly by uh, members of the South African National Defence Special Forces um, unit, and uh, he had been trying to obtain. Um, information from the SANDF that would have aided his uh, investigation. And we can talk a little bit more about how in the weeks and months preceding his assassination, the SANDF had been attempting to block those efforts and Matipa's effectively block Matipa's investigation. But um, he had, uh, on that uh, fateful evening, he had signed out uh, to his colleagues to say that he'd be out investigating this matter, supposedly going to go and uh, meet with some of those contacts. And he was driving along the N1 highway, in a, in a, from what we understand, uh, on that evening um, in his white uh, Volkswagen Polo, and he was shot, um, but shot once or twice in the head. It wasn't a spray of bullets. And that suggests the work of a skilled marksman, of somebody who knows uh, exactly what they're doing, uh, as opposed to a, a random act of violence or somebody trying to hijack a vehicle or steal something from somebody it was much more a clear message being sent to anybody uh, that they need to back off, otherwise they will meet the same fate as Lieutenant Colonel Franz Matipa. How did the SA in the FB interfere in his, invest- his investigation in the run-up to his assassination? Yeah, so 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 what we you know as as I said, what what Matipa was investigating was the alleged involvement of the SA in the and the abduction of two individuals at the Mall of Africa on the 29th of December last year. And what Batipa was attempting to do in, in terms of his investigation was to obtain um, the cell phone records, the tracker details um, of the individuals um, uh, that were at the Mall of Africa on that day. And we know they were there because the military has admitted that they were there. They said that the special forces just happened to be at the mall at this, exactly the same time and the same date in the same vicinity um, as as the people that were abducted, uh, Mr. Abadella, Abdella Abadiga and his bodyguard. Um, and they said that they were there on a trading exercise. So what Matipa was trying to do was to test this. And one way to test it was to say, right, we've got the number plates of the vehicles that were there. Those, those are there from CCTV, CCTV, uh, CCTV footage. And we've got photographs of members of special forces because they were paying with the with you know they're paying for their tickets their parking tickets in the mall they've got um, and and you know them actually inserting the tickets into the boom gates as they are leaving and photographs of that so so there's a there's extensive evidence that pinpoints special forces uh, in the mall on that day um, being able to track those vehicles uh, and their movements around the mall of Africa being being able to track the cell phone numbers of members of the of special forces could well have have led Matipa and can still lead uh, the Hawks to be able to identify 
exactly where those individuals were and whether that might be able to lead them to to what happened to to Mr. Abadega and and to the bodyguard. Um, and what the SANDF did was um, firstly said that to Matipa they would be very happy to work with him at meetings in April this year and said that they would provide evidence this we have uh, from, from Matipa in court records. But then at some point something turned within the South African National Defense Force um, and particularly a Major General Eric Menisi, who's the head of legal affairs at the SANDF, who had first been cooperative, he then said, that's no longer the case. We won't provide that information. Matipa had only one route forward, as any investigator would have on any number of criminal investigations, is to approach the courts. He approached the Randburg Magistrates Court in June, asked for a subpoena in terms of um, um, Section uh, 205, or what's called a Section 205 subpoena, meaning that they are ordering the other side to provide that information to assist his investigation. How the military responded to that was to try and interdict the process. They, in turn, went to the high court. They said, we are not going to provide this information. It's not in the interest of national security. A, we don't have this material, but B, that this is top secret or sensitive, uh, this is sort of top secret or sensitive um, 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 matters. So they were basically playing it both ways. And the judge, judge from the best days in this matter, on the 20th of July, that's just a couple of weeks, uh, literally two, two and a half weeks or so before Matipa's assassination, ruled um, that the, the you know, did not support this interdict application. Uh, the SANDF was, was ordered to pay costs, and that paved the way for uh, Matipa to gain access to those records. So their attempts to place obstacles in his way, legal obstacles, all failed that had come to naught. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the next step really was for him to obtain this crucial material um, that certainly wasn't in the interest, from what we understand, of South African Special Forces. Uh, to be revealed. Why would the SANDF wanted to kidnap the ISIS leader? So Abdullah Abadiga was a um, a refugee in South Africa. Uh, he, what we know, f- and we, but you know, I think what you just stressed, we, this hasn't ever been tested in court. What we know from the U.S. authorities that the U.S. Treasury put Abdullah Abadiga on a on a sanctions list last year for his links to the financing of terror activities. Uh, for ISIS, both in the DRC, where Abadiga had gone and tried to join and support um, a group establishing a caliphate in the eastern DRC, and then, of course, in northern Mozambique. We must remember that South African Special Forces and military are active in northern Mozambique and have been supporting the Mozambican military in uh, a a war that's been going on, both against uh, nationals, Mozambican nationals that are aggrieved by the rampant corruption involving big companies and, and politicians in northern Mozambique, and to an extent, of course, the uh, the, the, the ISIS-aligned forces that have, have been battling the military there. Um, so so he was a person of interest because he was supposed to have been a money man. He helped to move the money for, and understood how the money operations worked uh, for, for, for the Islamic State and its activities in southern Africa. Um, but, you know, of course, Abadiga had lived in South Africa for a long time. We understand he's been in the country since 2009. Um, exactly why a decision was taken uh, to to abduct him at this point, we don't know. Um, but it only adds to the you know to the overall mystery as to exactly what happened. Um, so we not only have crime of abduction potentially, but we have then the crime of murder, the assassination, killing a police official who's investigating, and then that shows a, a potentially a systemic pattern of cover up, uh, um, which you know I think is a are matters that are are not just, you know, these are not uh, just matters of intrigue or mystery. These are matters that threaten the constitutional order in South Africa. It requires a response from the president. It requires a response from the Minister of Defense and from the Minister of Police. We haven't heard a single word from any of these authorities on on these particular um, uh, chain of events uh, and, and these crimes that have been committed. And the ISIS leader and his bodyguard are still missing? Uh, Abadega and his bodyguard are still missing. They have not been seen um, since December. His brother did, in fact, go to court in in um, uh, February, March of this year, uh, and in an attempt to to compel um, the SANDF, who they suspected was involved in this operation, uh, to provide the whereabouts of Abdel Abadega and his bodyguard. Um, that matter was thrown out on procedural grounds. They had they'd approached the court on the basis that this was urgent, but they had 
waited some weeks to approach the court. Uh, but I think none of that has, you know, meant that meant that that the facts they presented are necessarily in dispute. In fact, what happened during that court case was that the SANDF had started off by saying that uh, they weren't there, and then they indicated that maybe their number plates had been cloned at the Mall of Africa on that day, and ultimately they then said, "No, we were there, and we were there on a training exercise." So, you know, you see this sort of uh, a moving target when it comes, if you like, to to what the truth was on that day. And uh, we certainly, unfortunately, don't know what happened to these two civilians uh, since then. Now, uh, that the Mall of Africa was not the only place where the special forces popped up. Can you tell us where else they featured? Yes, yeah, so our investigation, in fact, started somewhere else. And, and uh, it was 1,400-odd uh, kilometers away in Simonstown. And we, we had been spending some time looking at um, the, the movement of of uh, vehicles um, around the Lady R vessel that had docked in Simonstown in early December of 2022. And you might recall those were where weapons were were allegedly or certainly loaded off and uh, according to some loaded onto this Russian vessel, Russian sanctioned vessel. Um, and what we focused on was not so much what was loaded on or off, but the vehicles that were parked along, uh, along the dock side. Um, and uh, there were large transport vehicles um, tra- carrying containers. Those vehicles had come from Gauteng that were parked in a, in a sports field and that entered the Simonstown dockyard. But next to those vehicles are a row of luxury German vehicles, um, uh, Mercedes Combis and a BMW Coupe. What we were able to, to find uh, was we, were, we fortunately came upon photographs, high-resolution copies of photos that had been published extensively in the media of these particular vehicles. The difference between the version of the photos we've seen and those that have been publicized is that given that they're high-resolution, we can spot the number plates. And we were then able to take that number plate and after you know doing some searches, connected it to the Mall of Africa. And in fact, we see one of the vehicles, um, uh, the white Mercedes-Benz Combi that is parked next to the the shipment for the Lady R appears then three weeks later at the Mall of Africa um, in in what is believed to have been the SANDF's uh, possible role in the abduction of those two individuals. Um, that, of course, is peculiar in all, for all set of reasons. Why are special forces involved in uh, such a range of operations around the country? Um, obviously, they they should not be um, they cannot be undertaking operations when they're not acting in support of the police. Um, more generally. Why are they driving around in these fancy cars in the manner that they are doing? And you know, if you like, um, Chris, just to add, why the sloppiness? Why, why do you, you know, why do you um, reveal yourself by re- by using the same vehicle so soon uh, after you know, in one operation and then move on to another? It's not usually the manner in which the special forces operate. So uh, that has of certainly been able to place these these the special forces in in, in different uh, places. And maybe the last point to say is that. What, what we tracked down was that the, the vehicles are registered in against the, a, a special forces front company called Peters Communication Trust. Um, so, so they are owned directly by um, special forces, a front company set up to, to try and create some kind of a mask. Well, clearly the mask wasn't very effective in this instance. Uh, can you reveal who is funding that front company? Well, the front company is, is funded directly by the military. It's, it's a uh, from what we understand, the commander of um, the five special forces regiment in Palabora is is routinely um, uh, is re- routinely placed as a director of of this Peter's Communication Trust, um, and uh, General Mashejo, who was the former head of uh, of uh, five special forces regiment in Palabora, was uh, was the director until around about February or March this year. At that point. He was given a very, very significant prom- promotion within the military, which might well, have, well have been a coincidence, uh, and uh, and his name was then removed as as a director of that company. So, so that's you know that's uh, that's how we were then able to to link the events of the Mall of Africa with the operation um, at in Simonstown. We can't suggest that you know there's a direct link in in what was loaded on or off that ship and, and the, uh, the abduction of Abadega. But what we are rather saying is it's curious how this group of people are seen in, in a number of places um, that are loaded with political controversy and highly sensitive matters. And again, the, the, the very clear sloppiness of the manner in which they operated, whether that was by design or 
Um, it was just poorly implemented operations. We don't know. What that made the lieutenant suspect special forces involvement? So, so it, it wasn't that Franz Matipa was investigating this off his own steam. The reason for this is that um, Abadega's brother, who's in South Africa, um, he, through his lawyer, a man called Yusuf Kasim, who's based in, in Durban, they, from what we understand, went to um, the police very soon after the abduction, about seven days after. One does have to ask why they waited so long, but from what we understand, that's how long it took. Uh, uh, reported the matter, and then it was up to the police to investigate. The police had, in fact, started asking some questions of the military. Um, mm -hmm. The family of Abadiga, I think, felt that they were not getting any traction, that there was only pushback from the military, and that's the reason that they approached the High Court uh, with, you know, as I've described in in about March of last year, uh, this year, pardon me, with the with the evidence that they had at their disposal and the photographs. Um, which we have since publicized as well, that were presented in, in, in court and other members of the media have publicized as well. Um, and, you know, subsequent to that, the, the matter fell squarely on the, on the, on the you know, the inbox of, of, a, of another officer in the Hawks. And from what we understand, Franz Matipa just happened to be the officer who was handed the folder and the file and asked to investigate this. And, uh, and he ran with it. And obviously he, from what we understand, paid with his life for doing his work. How can you take this further to get justice for him? Well, we can't take this forward on our own. I think it's up to us as South Africans to demand um, accountability. We need to hear from our politicians and we need to hear from an a, 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 a array of politicians, including the president, as to what transpired. We can't have any, an inquiry, a closed and secret inquiry in this process. We need an open process. We need questions to be asked in parliament until I think right now we run the risk that given the sensitivity of this matter, given the, the risks that people feel around this issue. You know, people we've spoken to certainly are very concerned uh, um, about who is involved and what the consequences might be of speaking out. It's up to the people we elect and put in office um, to ask the questions of the military of what's going on and to support the Hawks in their investigation so that whoever is responsible for Matipa's murder um, is uh, investigated and prosecuted and held to account. Because if we don't do so, I think we would argue that the power of the people with guns will only grow, um, and that is a direct threat to our democracy. Thank you. That was Henny van Fieren, Open Secret, speaking to business about the assassination of Lieutenant Franz Matip of the books. Thank you, Henny. Thank you. <laughs>